Dr. Tom Phillips, um, John Moore's University. Um, thank you for mu very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, you have published a book chapter about Kurds in Syria, democratic confederalism. Uh, do you think Ojalan's ideas is an alternative system for capitalism? Um, yes, I believe that um, at some point in the future, hopefully not too far into the future, humanity could organize itself along more um, libertarian and socialist lines, which is what I believe Mr. Rogeland has in mind. There are certain underlying systems that have driven humanity towards this precipice. One of them, I think, is, is capitalism. We can also talk about other forms of hierarchy like patriarchy and nationalism. So I think it's a matter of human survival that we begin to think about alternative ways of organizing ourselves as a society. And I think Mr. Rogeland's ideas, which are informed by ideas of others such as Murray Bookchin kind of envisage a society where we live communally with radical direct democracy where we live in an ecologically sustainable way um, and I believe that that sort of society could indeed be an alternative to capitalism now of course the difficult question is you know how do we get there how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be uh, and that might very well be a long process but I think at some point, yes, it would be a valid um, and crucial alternative. Also, you're working on a book about Kurdish ecology and the human rights now. Um, so what is your observations about that? Well, I think the, the ecological dimension of um, the, the Kurdish idea, of Ojalan's ideas, are also really important. Um, in essence, the idea is that people live a communal life, self-sustainability, um it's all tied in with the idea of local democracy as well the the book chapter i'm currently working on is about how we would eventually achieve such a society that's ecologically sustainable and what human rights law has got to do with it and in, in brief the argument is that using the language of human rights is you know there's good things about it and there are also some bad things about it so on the one hand the bad things it's all about individuals, you're an individual victim, you have individual violators of human rights, you're supposed to appeal to the state for redress. It's kind of a neoliberal construct in a way. So that's not the kind of thing that we're really looking for in the long term. However, in the short term, um, social movements and so on can use the language of human rights. They can say, for example, look, the right to life, the right to self-determination, all of these things are very clearly incompatible with systems like capitalism which are driving humanity towards a precipice um, so the, the ecological dimension of these ideas is absolutely crucial and i think it's a two-sided story uh, as to whether or not we can use the language of human rights to help us to eventually reach that kind of society you have been in turkey both ahmed and uh, ankara for trial observations do you think that turkey is a democratic state and can you talk about human rights in turkey um the short answer to the to the question is no i don't believe that turkey is a democratic state um political scientists have varying different labels that they attach to it perhaps the, the most clear one is um competitive authoritarianism so it's an authoritarian country um you know i when i was in uh, diyarbakir or ahmed uh, and when i was in istanbul and elsewhere at election times all you ever see is a picture of erdogan's face TV news saturated with AKP propaganda. The other parties are all derided as terrorists and you know, whatever label you can come up with. Um, so it's authoritarian, but it's got competitive aspects to it. So as we saw with the CHP victory, for example, in Istanbul, in the local elections, it is possible for Erdogan to lose. Now, of course, when he does lose, he then sets about the victor and makes life difficult for them. So it's not a democracy. It's not full-blown authoritarianism either, but it's it's more authoritarian than, than democratic. Uh, as to whether I think there is a democratic future in Turkey, uh, I think that really depends on um, the power and strength and the organization of, of social movements, such as the Kurdish freedom movement, which are kind of a motor, a driving force towards the democratization of, of Turkey. So in a way that the Kurdish freedom movement is First of all, it's really important for Kurds who've been oppressed in Turkey ever since the Republic was founded. 
but it's also an important movement for Turkey more broadly to the extent that it can drive really important democratic reforms. Now, on the specific issue of the trial that I went to observe, uh, it was the trial of Selatin Demirtas. Uh, my name was given to the ambassador who passed it on to the authorities in Turkey. Uh, I traveled all the way there to observe the trial, only to be told that my name was not on the special list and I was not allowed to enter. So I stood outside in the cold for a few hours, kicking my heels, never actually got to see the trial, which I think is just one manifestation of the fact that it's an authoritarian country and not a democratic one. During the pandemic, AKP government has signed a new law in parliament that says free the most criminal and uh, dangerous uh, killers and organized criminals in Turkey. But we can still see that uh, the journalists, the writers, academics, professors are still being detained and imprisoned in Turkey. So um, what would you like to say about uh, the situation of political prisoners? Well, the situation of political prisoners um, in Turkey is an international disgrace. The very idea that you can release mafia members and organized criminals from prison due to the risks of COVID-19, but keep people in prison who are, by the way, unwell, people like Selati and Demirtas, just goes to reveal once again the authoritarian side of the Turkish system. And we should say something as well about the the original decision to imprison these people. You know, the, the language that's always used is terrorism. Everyone's a terrorist. Selatin Demirtas has to go to prison because of terrorist reasons. The same goes for journalists and poets and anyone you can think of. We've almost reached the stage now in Turkey where the word terrorist just means anyone who disagrees with President Erdogan and the ruling AKP party. So it, it's a term that should never be taken too seriously. I mean, that's true globally, to be quite honest, but it's particularly true in Turkey. Um, and, you know, I spoke about human rights law earlier on and, and how flawed it is. But at the same time, it's very clear um, that the detention of politicians and journalists and artists and others on these flimsy um, terrorism grounds is a complete violation of, of human rights law. I mean, very basic elementary human rights. Being kicked out from um, trade deals, also stop arms access to Turkey, boycott Turkey campaigns. Um, do you think um, Turkey needs to be under more pressure by um, other governments until they set freedom, Mr. Öcalan? Yeah, I'm reminded of the words of Noam Chomsky. He said, if, if the democratic states in the global north want to do something to stop terrorism, one important thing they can do is stop participating in it, you know, by sending weapons to, to the ruling party in Turkey, which we do on a massive scale, both my own country, the UK, the US and others. You know, when you send those weapons to Turkey and you know full well what they're going to be used for, you're basically aiding and abetting a campaign of terrorism against innocent people, right? So clearly that has to stop. But of course, it's easy to say that on moral grounds. Actually getting states to stop doing that is the difficult bit. So we have movements like the campaign against the arms trade, for example. We have people who take direct action to try and stop arms fares. All of these things, I think, um, ought to be supported. Um, but to be honest, the European Union hasn't been particularly hard on Mr Erdogan. And we all know the reason why, don't we? Because they don't want uh, desperate refugees coming across the border into fortress Europe. So they kind of use Erdogan as a policeman. You know, you keep the refugees over there. It doesn't really matter about their human rights. It doesn't matter about how badly they're treated. It doesn't matter about the fact that they're often sent back to Syria into a war zone. You know, you keep them there uh, and we won't be too hard on your human rights violations and on your slip into very severe kinds of authoritarianism. So yeah, things ought to be done both at the international level and there are things we can do as well individually and, and as a collective at the grassroots level to try and show solidarity with uh, with the Kurds and with people in Turkey more broadly. You are also peace in Kurdistan and freedom for Öcalan campaign supporter as well. So do you think Mr. Abdullah Öcalan is a key uh, for peace in Middle East and many conflicts in the world as well? Yes, um, I think it would be very difficult for anybody serious to say that Mr. Rojalan is not a key part of a future Kurdish peace process, if not the key part of that process. And I think the fact that he is held in detention on an isolated island, 
given very limited access to lawyers and family members and others is a um, an aberration that ought to be um, repaired. So Mr. Ozan ought to be freed, he ought to be engaged with. And he's shown in the past that when the state engages with Mr. Ojalan, he's quite constructive. He is interested in creating a peaceful environment and democracy in Turkey. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why he's not communicated with anymore, why he's kept in lockdown, kept in detention. Um, so yeah, there should be a complete revolution in the state's approach to Mr. Ojalan. Dr. Tom Phillips from John Moores University, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for supporting our channel today. That's okay, thank you. Pleasure.